Just six weeks after Greysteel, the Downing Street Declaration was issued by Prime Minister John Major and Taoiseach Albert Reynolds. Although few would admit it, the wording and core principles of the Declaration were based on ideas thrashed out by John Hume with Gerry Adams in their years of secret talks. It encouraged peaceful self-determination for Northern Ireland, it supported an all-Ireland voice, and it offered Republicans and Loyalists a seat at the negotiating table if they gave up their campaigns of violence. Within a year, there was a ceasefire on both sides. BBC gave the first news to the man whose talks with Gerry Adams have been a key part of the dynamic in all of this. That's it. That's it. That was an extraordinary day in Belfast. I was here working as a reporter and I will never forget the excitement and relief when the news of the ceasefire broke. We'd all been waiting for it for months on end and there'd been endless rumours that it was on, it was off, it was on. In fact, many people believed it would never happen. So when it finally came, it was a moment of real emotion and global importance. Imagine how John Hume felt. Adam's the founder of Seagate Technology agreed the deal to bring his business to Derry over a pint with John Hume in a bar in Los Angeles. Now there are 1,500 people working here. I um, was educated at St. Columns College, just, just across the road from here. Um, I wanted to do electronics, was my field. I left at, at that time, at the, the height of the troubles, I went, went to England. Um, I never thought for one minute I'd be back, uh, back in Derry. I mean, you were one of the first here 17 years ago, Joanne. What did it mean for you when Seagate opened here? Well, being from Donegal, you know, from, uh, it's meant that from the northwest, it brings a lot of uh, technical opportunities and both myself and my husband work here, so the whole family has moved up to Derry, where we're now living. For John Hume to swing a decision to get Seagate to locate in the northwest was a very, very influential decision. I mean, the fact that Seagate located here and I, myself and my wife, were able to, to find employment here, I mean, that's meant that our, I mean, our, my, my children have, have grown up here, are next to their grandparents, I and mean, the grandparents can see their grandchildren growing up, and I think that, that makes a difference in terms of that, that sort of family bond that exists. John Hume knew that the future of the North depended on people, on communities, on different traditions living side by side. In that regard, he really was inspired by Europe. An MEP since 1979, John always preferred the consensus approach of the European Parliament to the shouting confrontations of Westminster. But what Hume really admired about the European mainland was how it had healed its wounds after the Second World War. It was the very best example of conflict resolution. And when he received his Nobel Peace Prize here in Oslo in 1998, he marvelled at how age-old enemies on the continent had resolved their differences through respect. Let me just read you a little bit from Hume's Nobel speech. He said, all conflict is about difference, whether the difference is race, religion or nationality. Difference is of the essence of humanity. Difference is an accident of birth and it should therefore never be the source of hatred or conflict. The answer to difference is to respect it. Therein lies a most fundamental principle of peace, respect for diversity. After two decades, John Hume's unerring belief in peace and in respecting people's differences was getting somewhere. By the mid-1980s, Hume had helped to bring the two governments to the table. He'd also managed to globalise the problem by taking the Irish question to Washington, to Europe and onto the world stage. He was also bringing in lots of investment into the province, which would transform the lives of tens of thousands of people. But he hadn't yet achieved peace. This was the biggest H-block demonstration seen in Dublin so far. The marchers came from the four corners of Ireland to voice their protest in support of the hunger strike in the maze, which is now in its 41st day. The hunger strikes where Republican prisoners protested to be recognised as political prisoners of war saw a massive rise in support for Sinn Féin, alongside an equal rise in unionist anger following the Anglo-Irish Agreement. 
the third way, the middle ground, the peaceful path being promoted by John Hume and others, was rapidly shrinking. Hume ended up in a radio debate with Sinn Féin leader Gerry Adams and dismissed his offer of talks. John felt if he wanted to change the IRA mindset, he had to talk directly to the IRA. Shortly after that confrontation with Adams, Hume was summoned to meet IRA leaders. He was picked up, bundled into a car, blindfolded and taken across the border. As soon as he got there though, he realised that the IRA were trying to video the entire meeting, so he walked out. He was never interested in propaganda, just peace. But peace seemed further away than ever. In Northern Ireland, the IRA say they killed an Ulster businessman whose body was discovered on a South Armagh border road earlier today. It's believed that SAS soldiers and a special RUC unit had set up the ambush in Loch Gall. Nine people were dead and the RUC believe they wiped out an IRA unit. The bomb exploded at a quarter to eleven as the townspeople moved into place around the war memorial, waiting quietly in the cold for the Remembrance Day ceremony to begin. During the day, the list of known dead slowly grew until it reached 11. The horror of Enniskillen made Hume even more determined to keep going. He'd already persuaded the two governments, America and Europe, to get involved in his pursuit of an agreed Ireland. But he realised that to go any further, he'd have to get Republicans on board and persuade them that there was a genuine, peaceful alternative. Sinn Féin had a third of the nationalist vote, but were literally without a voice. Well, so far as I know, the IRA have not decided the time is right to end violence. Gerry Adams could see the inroads that Hume, the peaceful constitutional nationalist, was making. John Hume could talk with the Taoiseach. He could knock on the door of number 10 and it would open. He was invited to lunch with American presidents and to dinner with European leaders. Adams couldn't get a visa to get on a plane. At the same time, Republicans and the British government were both beginning to realise that the troubles might just be unwinnable and unending. Sinn Féin were more open to alternatives. Perhaps it was time to listen to what John Hume had to say. In Clonard Monastery in West Belfast, Father Alec Reid brokered a meeting. It was here in parlour room number four in Clonard that John Hume and Gerry Adams used to have their secret meetings. Hume used to come in by the front door, Adams by the back. The story goes that two local nuns actually put miraculous medals under the seats of both men. The talks eventually became public knowledge and to the outside world, John Hume was doing the unthinkable, talking to terrorists. This is 1988 and there's been a lot of calls. A year opened with everybody who was eminent in sight calling for dialogue. What's I'm the point engaged of in dialogue? dialogue. What's and, the point well, of Brian, dialogue? Would you let me answer your question? What about this point though? You have said repeatedly that you will not speak to people who are ambiguous on violence. I did not say that. I have said repeatedly that I will speak to anyone if I believe that talking to them will make uh, a contribution to peace and stability on, this, uh, on, uh, on our island. Is it the case that and, you spoke... And I hope that this dialogue will lead to just that. Is it but the I case... wouldn't wish to raise anybody's expectation. Case... And I'm going to explore every avenue that yesterday's talks opened up for and me. what about the argument... People... I will speak to anyone. People would now... I would... will speak to anyone. Sure, you've said that several yes. times. 
many people would say... It's worth remembering that back in the late 1980s, when John Hume sat here in this room with Gerry Adams, no one was talking to terrorists. So it was amazingly courageous and historic for John Hume to do that. It was a huge risk for him to take, but he decided that high-risk strategy was worthwhile because the prize was peace. Formal talks between the SDLP and Sinn Féin continued and eventually fell apart. But Hume continued to meet with Adams secretly, out of the media spotlight, all the way up to 1993, as they worked to find a way forward, if not for a united Ireland, at least for an agreed alternative to violence. Then, Adams was photographed going into Hume's home in Derry. John Hume and Gerry Adams' joint statement at the weekend is still sending shockwaves through the political world in the North. The initiative has instilled fear throughout a large section of the unionist community. They believe that by talking to Sinn Féin, the message being sent to paramilitaries is violence pays. Northern Ireland is part of our democracy. Hume was attacked from all sides for giving legitimacy to the IRA and their campaign of terror. Yet we now know that both governments were also talking to Republicans at the same time. Everyone was looking for a peaceful solution. I naturally felt it was my duty because I've made clear all along throughout my political career throughout the last 20 years that I'll talk to anyone if the net result of it is going to save human lives. And we have a duty, those of us who believe in totally peaceful means, to use all our powers of persuasion with the people involved in both camps. And I'm doing that, and I apologize to nobody. But then came seven of the darkest days in Northern Ireland, when all the attacks on Hume seemed justified. An IRA bomb ripped through Frizzell's fish shop on the Shankill Road, killing nine innocent victims and one of the bombers. Days later, Gerry Adams carried the IRA bomber's coffin. Watching at home on TV, John Hume broke down in tears of frustration. That weekend, in retaliation for Shankill, Loyalist gunmen walked into the Rising Sun Bar in Greysteel and killed seven more innocent bystanders. People murdered last week were every bit as innocent as were the people in the Shankill Road. And I would be certain that the families of the people in the Shankill Road would be horrified that the murder of their loved ones would be used as an excuse to do exactly the same. This followed, obviously, the Frizzell's fish shop, which I'd also covered, so there was an incredible amount of anguish and hardship, but it was like it was relentless, and you felt at one stage that this talk of a peace process was actually crazy, because there was no way there could be peace when things like this were going on. And it's not that any funeral is more sad than another one, but I think just on the day here, it was just incredibly poignant. I mean, people were, they were like literally wailing. It was just incredible. I remember just at one moment looking over, I was over there to my left, and I saw Pat and John Hume, and he literally completely broke down. He was weeping, because some woman I noticed had gone up and spoken to him. And it's just a memory that's always stayed with me. John's wife, Pat, has told me since that Grace Steele was her breaking point. She asked her husband to stop his talks with Adams, to step away from his campaign. It was simply all getting too much. 